How are we feeling today? Everybody feeling good? Yeah. You, feel, you feel like a drowned duck? We just thought it was Baptism Sunday over there. It's Baptism Sunday everywhere. We, we let the good Lord sprinkle on you a little bit today when you was walking in. And I'm sorry I didn't hug you. I just don't, I just don't hug wet. I'm sorry. I don't hug wet. I speak to wet, but I don't hug wet. It's an honor to see all of you today. And by the way, it's always an honor to see you. Every time this church has people in it, I feel so honored. I am, uh, I am the assistant pastor here. Jesus is the pastor. And every, every Sunday, every Sunday without fail since I have come to Austin, Texas, I've resigned this church and my leadership to him. It's his Sunday. It's his Wednesday night. It's his. It's not mine. This is not my church. It's his church. He suffered and died and bled for us so he could establish this church. I have the privilege of getting to talk for him sometime. And uh, my dad said, son, be an influence everywhere you go, and when necessary, use words. That's what daddy taught me. Now, mama taught me to talk all the time. So I'm a mixture between dad and mom. And it's a joy to see you. If you're a first-time guest here, we're happy to have you. And if I didn't get to see you, you missed a West Texas handshake and a good old hello from Leveland Sundown, Texas, out there in West Texas. I'm a true West Texan, true West Texan. Some people claim West Texas, and they live just west of Fort Worth. Come on, somebody. That ain't West Texas. you got to get out there. I can see El Paso almost. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? You're incredible people, and I love you from the bottom of my heart, and I'm so happy to be able to address you today in the name of the Lord. Yesterday was our Freedom Conference Friday evening, and yesterday, and that's the reason the cross is here today. The cross was in the middle, and we're going to use that today. The cross is going to be a symbol of what we're preaching about today. But yesterday afternoon, we had a Holy Spirit call, and Pastor Brad spoke on the Holy Spirit for about 30 minutes at the end of a beautiful two-day session. And everybody that did not have the Holy Spirit came running forward, not walking, running forward to receive the Spirit of God. You know, God's Spirit's always abiding. It's, all, it's everywhere. God's everywhere. But He manifested Himself yesterday here. And 35 people were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit right here yesterday. In about 15 minutes, in about 15 minutes, it's the most unbelievable thing, and yet it's believable because God's still up to doing God. And when you get out of the way, God can be a good God. We stop God from doing a lot of stuff for us, but He can be a good God, and He is a good God. And today, I don't know how many they baptized. Anybody count? We got a statistician out here that counted the number. How many was baptized? Y'all count it? Surely somebody did. <laughs> The day I ask, nobody did. And the day I don't ask, everybody tells me when I get out the door. <laughs> You're awesome. Say, Pastor, preach to me today. Pastor, Let the word touch my mind. Word touch my mind. Let, it my mind. Let it change my mind. Preach to me today. Preach Let the word touch my heart. Touch my heart. Let, it Let it change my heart. Preach to me today. To Let, me Let me leave here. A better person, a better person. than what I was. When I came in, turn to somebody and smile at them and say, I'm glad to be sitting by you today. And you may be seated. You may be seated. I'm speaking today on the subject, Jesus light. Jesus light. Everything you always wanted in a Savior and less. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about today. Someone stole Jesus. It happened one Saturday night a few years back at, a, at the Church of the Holy Cross in Midtown Manhattan, New York City. The church is located on West 42nd Street. It has a rich tradition. Patrick Duffy, many of you remember that name, the famous World War I chaplain, was its first notable leader. And returning from Europe, Duffy was sent to Hell's Kitchen, one of the roughest parts of New York City. And his parish extended toward, westward toward Times Square. So notable were his accomplishments in that rough 
area that to this day, his statue stands in the heart of Times Square. I have seen it. Yet it wasn't the statue of Reverend Duffy which was stolen. It was an item from within the church itself, a four foot tall plaster rendering of Jesus Christ. The statue was unbolted from its wooden cross near the church's entrance, and it wasn't the church's first theft. Before that, someone had made off with the metal offering boxes in which people dropped donations all day and most of the night. But this was something different. Someone stole Jesus. <laughs> No windows were broken, no sign of forced entry. Someone carried Jesus right out the front door, folks. One of the church workers, a man named David, was confused by the theft. He thought it didn't make sense. If it was as if he said, the thieves must have decided, we're going to leave the cross and just take Jesus. They took Jesus and they left the cross. The man I'm preaching about today wrote some fabulous books in the New Testament. In fact, 14 are given credit to him. And he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 2 of his first book. He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I didn't write that. I just read that. I do not want to sound sacrilege today, but for the past many years, America has endured the taste great, less filling ads of Miller Light Beer. Old Mr. Miller's got a light beer. And one of the bylines is everything you always wanted in a beer and less. Anybody ever heard that commercial? First service acted like they hadn't heard it. And a preacher had heard it. <laughs> kind of made me feel like a sinner. <laughs> preaching to a bunch of saints. I want to talk to you about Jesus' light today. Everything you always wanted in a Savior and less. Paul wrote the Scripture setting to the Corinthians. And the two most prominent men in the New Testament are Jesus, number one, and Paul, the apostle, number two. Yet Paul is woefully inadequate up next to Jesus, and he recognizes that himself. Jesus is without sin, and Paul knew he wasn't. Like Jesus, Paul was tempted, but unlike Jesus, Paul failed. Jesus was our older brother in triumph. Paul is our young brother in transgression. Contrast Paul's statement with Christ. Paul said, I'm not worthy to be even called an apostle. Jesus said, I am the first and the last. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. Jesus said, which of you convicts me of sin? Paul said, I am the good that I would do, I do not. Jesus said, Satan has nothing in me. Paul simply knew he was not in the Lord's league. He knew that. Yet he was shocked to learn that the Corinthians had divided themselves into various fan clubs. Some of them said, boy, I love it when Apollos preaches. Somebody else said, I love it when Cephas, Simon Peter, preaches. Somebody said, you know, Paul does real good too, but he preaches a long time and people fall asleep and fall out windows. <laughs> and then there were some that said, you know, we kind of like Christ. We kind of like Jesus. Paul was offended on the Lord's behalf because those three men could not compare to the Christ that he talked about in his writing. The first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians provides clues as to who Paul thought was worthy of praise. In the first 10 verses, Paul mentions his name only one time, but he mentions Jesus' name 10 times. 
Paul made certain that the Corinthians knew that the Lord was to receive honor and not him. Paul had a message to the church of the Corinth. That message was Jesus. Can I stand here today and tell you, I don't want to know anything else either except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul could have written the great song that's been sung for ages in the church. On cross the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2 again and read just verse 2 in the Amplified Version. I want you to see how powerful this is. Paul said, for I resolve to know nothing. Say nothing. nothing. To be acquainted with nothing. Say nothing. nothing. To make a display of the knowledge of nothing. Say nothing. nothing. And to be conscious of nothing. Say nothing. nothing. Now you can quit talking. I'm going to talk. Among you except Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and Him crucified. I don't want to know anything except Him and Him crucified. In the message version, he said, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who He is. Then Jesus and what He did. Jesus crucified. Who Jesus is and what Jesus did, that's what Paul's consistent message was throughout the New Testament. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. Paul wanted every believer in Corinth to understand that. He didn't grow complex. He didn't get mystical. He kept it plain and he kept it simple. Jesus, Paul seems to say, is the sum total of the Christian experience. Jesus himself said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. We think it's a way. No, no, no. The way is about this broad. It's as broad as the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way. If you're going to get to the Father, you've got to come through Jesus. He is the way. Oh, somebody help me preach. You can't get there through Buddha. Buddha. You can't get there through San Marcos. You can't get there through Ali. You can't get there through all these other gods. The only way to get to the Father is through Jesus Christ. In Acts 9, we read the story for the first time. Paul repeats it in Acts 22. He repeats it again in Acts 26. He never grew tired of telling the story of how Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. Paupers and kings and Dignitaries, it didn't matter. Paul shared Jesus everywhere he went. In Acts 26, when Paul was standing before King Agrippa, he began to tell of the glorious experience on the road to Damascus. He was smitten, he said. He heard a voice speaking to him, he said, telling him it's hard for him to kick against the pricks. And then Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And when heaven spoke in Hebrew to Paul that day, our Lord connected the Jehovah of the Old Testament with the Jesus of the New Testament. I will declare to you that the saving name of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Which means, Jesus means Jehovah has become our salvation. That's why Luke said in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This, this, this church needs to lift Jesus higher than we've ever lifted him in our life. Come on. It's time to clap your hands big for Jesus right now. It's time. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes to the Corinthian church, the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. He said, I delivered what I received. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He was seen of Cephas, then the twelve, seen of 500 brethren at once, some of whom are still alive, he said. He was seen of James, then all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. The light that struck Paul down was more than a simple illumination. That light right there is just an illumination. The light that struck Paul down was the light of the world. It was the light of the world, the glory of God in the highest. Paul saw Jesus, and he was never again the same. 
because Paul knew Jesus was God, not a pseudo God, but God made man. Folks, when you run into Jesus, you will never be the same again. You may try a lot of pseudo gods, but when you run into Jesus, oh, somebody help me preach right now. You'll leave there a different way than you came in. Paul later described the preeminence of Christ in Colossians chapter 1 when he said, he's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of every creature. By him, everything was put together. By him, everything stays together. He's the head of the body. He's the firstborn from the dead. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is what man needs, folks. Jesus is what he needs. And this church needs to present Jesus to people that need Jesus in this hour. He's bread. He's water. He's life. He's light. He's power. He's high priest. He's counselor. He's comforter. He's prince of peace. He's meaning. He's purpose. He's wholeness. He's fulfillment. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's beginning and end, the first and last, which was, which is, and is to come. Paul was emphatic when he said, I want to know nothing but Jesus. I want to think nothing but Jesus. I wish to hear nothing but Jesus. Minor on me, he said, but major on him because he increases and everything else will decrease. Amen. Amen. Keep it plain. Keep it simple. Jesus lives. He's alive and he's greater than he's ever been. And what you don't know if you're not a believer is he still got the whole world in his hands. Amen. And it doesn't matter what this world does and how they bellyache and how much they fight in the Middle East and how much wars and rumors of wars goes on. God's got it all under control. And one day he's coming back to get us. Hallelujah. He's coming back to get us and we're going home to be with him. Jesus is God in the flesh. He died for me at Calvary. God became our Savior in the form of Jesus Christ. On a tree, Jesus died for you and me. Say amen to that. Amen. Jesus took possession of that tree. I never realized this till I studied this the last time. And recently I saw this. Matthew called it his cross. Mark called it his cross. John called it his cross. And Paul called it his cross. Jesus identified. He said, this is my cross. This is mine. The one who had no place to lay his head. The one who was despised and rejected of men. The one who made himself of no reputation. The one who held nothing while in this world. The same one took possession of the cross. And through the cross, he redeemed us. He bought us. He captured our souls for himself. Upon his cross, precious blood was spilled. And the question is why, not how. Why would good die for evil? Why would a sinless Christ die for the sinful? John 3, 16 said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that's not all, folks. The Lord gave and the Lord, I love gave and love gave all. But here's what else he did. When he was buried, he went down to the inner prison of hell and he took the keys of death and hell in the grave away from the devil. Mm, 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 mm. And on his way out, he opened prison doors and led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. I'm here to declare that the devil lives in a place, and he don't even have the keys to his own house. I'm talking about a Jesus. I'm talking about a Jesus. I'm talking about a Savior, and I'm talking about the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One Saturday night in New York City. Thieves took Jesus, but they left the cross. You know what? Let me preach a little bit. Y'all call it meddling. I'm going to preach a little. That's the desire of the world today. Give us Jesus, but preacher, we don't want the cross. Give us a healer. Give us a blesser. Give us a deliverer. Give us a husband and wife finder. You didn't catch that, did you? Give us a job, a better paying job, a better paying job, but don't give us the price tag. 
in this Jesus-like generation, give us everything we want in religion and less. You know, I love contemporary music. I said I may love it, but I do love it. But I do not want or love contemporary Christianity. I don't want people that just want the blessing of it and not the burden of it. This thing is a walk with Jesus Christ. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, but I also want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. And there's times we're going to go through some things. We're going to preach with pain in our body. We're going to come to church hurting. That's the suffering side. But we're going to know him in the power of his resurrection also. You hear me? Jesus is always going to be there for us because he is the awesome Alpha and Omega in our life. I want Jesus with the cross, not without it. Paul said in Corinthians, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. I do not just want his grace. I want to seek his face. I want more than just blessings. I want to carry the burdens of people in my life. I want his goodness, but I want to worship in his holiness. I desire his power, but I must understand his sufferings. Jesus' light is a gospel that many are preaching, but a gospel that Jesus is not blessing because he is a Christ of the cross. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was a type of being and doing of the Lord. It was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Jesus is both God and man. He's man like the wood. He's gold to overcover the wood. It was crowned with gold. Jesus is king of kings. There's an unbroken tablet of law within. Jesus is the fulfillment of that law. He fulfilled the law on the cross. There's a golden pot of manna within. Jesus is the bread of life. There's an almond branch, almond branch that was budded within. Christ is a supernatural in birth and resurrection. And when the ark fell into the enemy's hands, it was opened and apparently thieves removed the pot of manna and the almond rod. They took away the provision, the power, and the miracles. What about the law, Pastor? What about the Word of God? No, they let that alone. So I asked, miracles anyone? Oh, yeah, preacher. Word anybody? Get real, preacher. We just want the miracles, not the Word. Give us Jesus, but not the cross. Give us a miracle worker, but not his blood. There was a prophecy uttered in Azusa Street in 1906. It was the beginning of what was called the latter rain in America. People received the Spirit of God 24 hours a day. They had church all day, every day, all night, every night. And people came from everywhere and received healing and miracles and power and glory in their life. But there was three prophecies that came out of that Azusa Street meeting. One was there will be an overemphasis on power rather than on righteousness in the last day. The second was there will be an overemphasis on praise to a God that people no longer pray to. And number three, there will be an overemphasis on the gifts of the Spirit rather than the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. I want to declare to you, I want everything that's been said here in the second portion. I want the righteousness of God. I want a God that I can pray to and have my prayers answered. And I want the Lordship of Jesus in my life. I don't want him just to be a master to me. I want him to be Lord of my life. And when he's Lord of your life, he'll take care of your life. No, nobody's business. Come on, help me preach somebody. Somebody needs to call him Lord today. He needs to be Lord today in your life. Frank Bartleman, the biographer of Azusa, saw it that as well. He said, there seems to be a great danger of losing sight of the fact that Jesus was all in all. See, the work of the cross, the atonement, must be the center of our consideration. Jesus must be the center of everything. But which Jesus are you choosing today? Please choose the one that went to the cross for you. When choosing the Messiah, you have a choice. You can choose Jesus as he was or Jesus as you wish him to be in your life daily. The former saves and heals and delivers. The latter is powerless. I don't want another Jesus. Give me the one who died for me. Give me the one who was buried for me. Give me the one who got up out of the grave for me. 
Give me the one who took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the devil for me. Give me the one that ascended one day, and give me the one that's coming back to get us one day. That's the Jesus I want. Clap your hands real big all over this house. Give me the one that tells me to pick up my cross and follow him. Let me confess my sins instead of just confessing promises. Let me claim my Savior instead of just claiming my inheritance. You know, yesterday was such a beautiful day. In freedom, people come, and they come to express sorrow for sin. And it's not anything that we make them do. It's just the power of the word. And they come, and many of you, you'll probably see when you leave, there's, there's a lot of torn paper down here. These are things that people said, I don't want in my life anymore. And they put them at the foot of a symbol. This is not the cross, of, the symbol of the cross. And I know that it's just a symbol. But one day, Jesus died on that cross, and his blood dripped to the ground. And when the first drop of blood from Jesus hit the ground there was a huge earthquake and graves were open and saints of past came out of those graves when Jesus was resurrected three days later those graves were open for three days and somebody was saying when he gets up I'm getting up because he was the first fruit of our resurrection that's the Jesus I'm preaching about today a Jesus I'm preaching about today doesn't matter how long you've been dead in the trespasses of sin in your life doesn't matter how long you've been fighting with alcohol and drugs, how long you've been fighting with all kinds of things in your life and going to sobriety meetings and trying to get it right. I'm telling you, when one drop of his blood gets on you, ah, hallelujah, when one drop of his blood gets on you, it'll cause you to get up out of that situation It'll cause you to throw off your grave clothes and come out shouting, Jesus is the reason I'm alive today. Somebody say amen to that. Glory. Let me confess my sins instead of just confessing promises. Let me claim my Savior instead of just claiming my inheritance. Oh, I'll praise him, but I'm going to also pray to him. I'm going to celebrate him. But I'll also consecrate my life to him also. I want to know his power, but I also want to know the fact that sometimes the righteous suffer. The prophet Malachi had a supernatural, said a supernatural purge was coming to God's house. He said it'll be like a refiner's fire to purify the sons of Levi. Levi represented the ministry. And I see it happening. I see that refiner's fire coming. Because every person that doesn't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm saying this with love and compassion, there's a refiner fire coming. And in that day, we will not ask, what can my faith get me? We will ask, how shall I stand before the Lord? The Jesus light dross will be purged, and God's presence will burn so bright that petty games and ego trips will disappear. And it'll burn like an oven, and the proud will be its fuel. Strongholds of the enemies will fall away. It'll be a purge church, a church call to repentance. One of revival fires among the youth. A resurgent of prayer among our elders. And one that cries of intercession and travail. Chains are going to be broken and people will be set free. And people will reject Jesus' light for the light of the world. Hallelujah. I believe with all my heart that that day's coming quicker than you could ever imagine. I want to thank the pastor of this church for letting me preach today. I think he's happy with what I preached today. Fanny Crosby was a blind songwriter. She's in a city one day that boasted that the Messiah lived there. It just so happened that as she was walking down the street... Someone told her the Messiah was directly across the street at that moment. And she asked, would you lead me across the street? And then with no hesitation, asked the so-called Messiah to let her feel his hands. And when she did, she immediately called him what he was, an imposter, a fake, a charlatan, an interloper. 
She, she went on to declare that her Messiah would have nail prints in his hands. And on the street that night, right then, she wrote the glorious song, I Shall Know Him. I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prints of the nails in his hand. Paul said, if I or an angel come preaching any other gospel, save what I have delivered to you, let him be accursed. Let me preach Jesus and let me preach him crucified, buried and risen. That's the Jesus I want to meet one day. That's the Jesus I want to direct my life. If you leave here today, take Jesus, but please take the cross with you also because Jesus that I preach about is the Jesus that died on the cross for us. A Christ without a cross is no savior. It's an imposter. It's not just who he is, but what he's done. And that's what makes him so, so special. I would appreciate it not to give me a hand clap, but to give the leader of this church a hand clap of praise right now. I'm done. I got up this morning thinking about heaven. Every now and then I just think about heaven. And I, I've heard people say, I'll meet you in the morning just inside the eastern gate. You know what? The eastern gate's going to be pretty crowded. It'd be hard to find each other inside the Eastern Gate. But I'll tell you what, why don't we all meet one day by the river? Because this church would not be the church that it is if the river of life didn't run through it. We don't worry about gates around here. We're not going to worry about that. But I love the fact the river runs through this house. There's a spirit of God that flows in this house. I can't create it. I can't make it happen. But I can respond to it. And this church will continue to see growth because we're going to preach the true Christ in this house for the rest of our days. I don't know how many we baptized. I don't know. Philip, would you and Brother Marnie come and help me right quick? Come and help me right quick. I have preached with the cross. Being down here and me up here, it's kind of wrong. But it would be hard to preach around it. But I want them to elevate the cross here today. Put it right here. This is it's what we're about. I don't know what I'd have done the day he died. I don't know what I would have done. I don't know if I'd have run or if I'd have been there. All the disciples left except John. I don't know what I'd have done. But I do know this. 
sometime during the day I'd have come back and said I'm grateful for what he did because it dawned on a centurion what he was doing it had to dawn on the disciples what he was doing and I want you to understand as long as the pastors of this church pastor this church this is the Christ we will preach the Christ of the cross the Christ of the cross he loves us he loves us and you know what when I get behind it you can't hardly see my face you still see my blue bell but not my face I can hide behind the cross it's a joy to preach the cross it's a joy to know the cross Christ of the cross is on our side he loves us I love you very much would you raise your hands let me pray over you right now dear father I love these precious people and I love the fact that they have come to hear the word today and come to be blessed and I want to lean on the cross all the days of my life I want to love it I don't want a Jesus light ministry I want a Jesus ministry that preaches you the right way and loves people like you loved people God thank you for every baptism today those were salvations thank you for the Holy Spirit falling on 35 people yesterday thank you for the joy that this church possesses and the peace that passes understanding and thank you for today and we'll be here Wednesday night to magnify you in praise and worship and I love you with all that I am and I love these people and they love you Lord and they love this house and they love this ministry and they love each other thank you for that for it's in Jesus name I pray and everybody said amen, amen. now listen listen don't be in a hurry to leave because we got all day around here we'll lock up when you're gone but stay and visit but when you leave take the cross with you not physically but take it with you I love you see you Wednesday night you're the best people in the world I love you